Did you make any New Year's resolutions? Did you make New, New Year's resolutions? How are you doing with them? Uh, you know, I read in Business Insiders magazine uh, this week that 96% of Americans believe that we should keep our New Year's resolutions for at least a month. <laughs> And 80% of all of us who make New Year's resolutions have completely abandoned them by February. So we are great at making commitments, not so great at keeping them. But, you know, uh, if you keep your commitments, whatever New Year's resolutions you made, if you keep them by, by till Valentine's Day, you're way above average, okay? And do you know what the top commitments were, the top New Year's resolutions this year, probably not going to surprise you. Number one, now these are based on online searches uh, as they evaluated what people were looking for online. They figured out what the top New Year's resolutions were for 2019. Number one, exercise and lose weight. Number two, save more money. Number three, get more sleep. Number four, spend more time with family. All good, right? I mean, those are great commitments. Anybody would say to anybody who is doing any of those, right on, keep doing it. Because each of them reflects the fact that we believe we can do better and we can see some improvements. All of that's good. But let me ask you a question. Did you make, are you willing to make any spiritual New Year's resolutions? Are you wanting to do anything different in your spiritual life in 2019? Well, that's what I want us to look at today, and I want to lay a challenge before our church today as we look together at the subject, Keys to a Spiritually Productive 2019. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to a very familiar passage of Scripture in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, we're going to begin looking at verse 1. Here's what Jesus said, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Now, a vine dresser is basically another way of saying the farmer who is, you know, taking care of the vineyard. Every branch, he said, in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he goes on to say, I am the vine, and you are the branches, and whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing." If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. So we're talking about something serious here. This is not a frivolous matter. This is life and death. And Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that your personal commitments can actually make a difference in the effectiveness or the productivity or the fruitfulness of your spiritual life in 2019? Let me ask it another way. Do you think what you do has any impact or plays any role whatsoever? Well, I like what David Jeremiah, the Bible teacher, author, you probably have some of his books, you've listened to him on the radio. David Jeremiah said this not too long ago, some believe we have little or no role in our own Christian maturity. God does everything they think, and we simply have to let go and let God. It's true, the Holy Spirit alone can produce the character of our Lord Jesus, and we must always abide in Christ. But the Bible also makes us active partners in the process, and we must be diligent to do our part. Now, that's what I want us to look at this morning. 
is what can we contribute? What role do we play in our own spiritual productivity, our own fruit bearing in our own spiritual life? Now, Jesus here is in the upper room on the last night of his life. Let me just put in context where this passage occurs because it is highly significant uh, the more you think about what he's saying. Jesus is now in the last hours of life on earth. We don't know exactly what time the Passover meal began, but it would have been late in the day. How do I know? Simple, because the Passover began at sundown. Sundown this time of the year is late at night because this was what? The spring of the year. How do I know? Because Passover and Easter are the same time of year, late in the year, March, April, uh, and therefore the day would have been long and it would have been late in the day before sundown. Are you with me? We know even today that sometimes Jewish families will go to midnight during their Passover celebration. Not all of them, but some of them. The highly committed people will sometimes go into the wee hours of the morning participating in the Passover. This event is the Last Supper. It is the Passover event. Jesus has already had the Passover meal. He has already washed the feet of the disciples, and now he is drawing them into a time of teaching. So I can't tell you exactly what time it is, but it would not be far off the mark to suggest that it was somewhere around 9 p.m. when this teaching began. Keep in mind, he will be crucified at 9 a.m. the next morning. And in those last hours of his life, Jesus wanted to talk to his disciples about being spiritually productive, about bearing fruit in their Christian life. How important must it be that Jesus talks about this in the last teaching that he ever gives to his disciples on earth? He's talking about leading spiritually productive lives. Six times in four verses, Jesus mentions bearing fruit. And uh, this is obviously a parable or a kind of parabolic extended metaphor in which Jesus is describing an Israeli vineyard with the branches loaded down abundantly with the grapes in full, uh, you know, bloom. And uh, they're abundant. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and the grapes or the fruit are those things which are produced in your life as a direct result of your relationship to me. In other words, anything that happens in our life that would not happen if we were not connected to Jesus, we could say that is the productivity of the Christian life. That is the fruit of the Christian life. It could be a lot of different things. It could be people you lead to Christ. It could be uh, the family members that you influence for Christ. It could be Christian characteristics that you are displaying in your life that you didn't used to display. It could be, as uh, mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, fruit of the Spirit. But fruit in the Christian life simply defined as this, Anything and everything that grows out of your life as a direct result of your relationship to Jesus Christ. Let me put it in a more succinct way. The fruit of the Christian life is the manifestation of Jesus Christ in your life. It is Christ displaying himself through your everyday life. And Jesus here is concerned enough so that in the last hours of his life, he is telling them, guys, I want you to lead spiritually productive lives. So here's the question. How are we going to do it? I want to show you two principles. And uh, principle number one is this. You can experience a spiritually productive life if you accept the requirements. If you accept the requirements. Now, what do I mean by requirements or responsibilities? In other words... Look at verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. One of the last lessons that Jesus ever taught was the lesson of fruit bearing, the lesson of productivity, the lesson of experiencing the manifestation of the life of Christ through your everyday life. 
How important is it if Jesus used his last night on earth to teach it? How significant must it be? I love what Rick Warren said not long ago on this subject. Bearing fruit is the purpose of my salvation. Wow, what a strong statement. Bearing fruit is the purpose of my salvation. You say, well, I thought the purpose of my salvation is to go to heaven. Well, I will never uh, undermine uh, or underestimate the value of going to heaven. Amen for heaven. But ladies and gentlemen, when you got saved, you didn't go immediately to heaven. God left you here in order to manifest the life of Christ through your life, through what you say, through what you do, through how you live, through those things that are born out of you that would never happen except by your relationship to Jesus Christ. Now, the key word here is the word abide. If you're going to bear fruit, you've got to abide. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask, uh, 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 ask whatever you wish, it'll be done for you. And by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, proving to be my disciples. The key word here is abide. In fact, the word abide occurs seven times in four verses. The word abide is literally the word which means the place where you live. It is where you remain. It means to remain, to stay, to be permanent. And it is as opposed, like I have a house. I live in my house. If I decide to go camping for the weekend, which by the way, I'm not going camping for the weekend. <laughs> Amen? The ground is hard. The air is cold. I have a house. I prefer my house. You want to go camping? Man, you have my blessings. Amen? Facebook it. I'll enjoy every minute of it for you. But if you go camping for the weekend, that's not where you live. That's just a recreational event. If you go off, you know, to the Holy Land for a few days, you get to come home. Amen? because we have houses to live in. The word abide means your permanent dwelling place where you live. Now notice what Jesus said, abide in me. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, for the believer, Jesus is home sweet home. We live in him. We don't make pop calls. We don't just drop by twice a month on, uh, to church and say, okay, I'm living in Jesus. Uh, we don't just open our Bibles occasionally and say, I'm living in Jesus. We don't just occasionally pray and say, I'm living in Jesus. If you want a spiritually productive life, you've got to live in Jesus. He is your home. He is your dwelling place. He is your life. Everything revolves around him. He is numero uno. He is the captain of the team, and he is your permanent dwelling. A friend of mine had surgery, and in order to recover, he had to stay in his house for one month. And you may say, well, that sounds like prison. Well, it was recovery, but I'm sure he would have liked to have gotten out some. The only time he left his house was to go to the doctor for checkups, and he had to spend a month inside his house as his recovery. That was his dwelling. That was his permanent place. In a sense, that's what I'm talking about when I say you live in Jesus. You are born again. And, and you say, well, how do I know if I'm living in Jesus? Well, have you been born again? You see, I believe in the new birth. Amen. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 7, don't be surprised if I say to you, you must be born again. And if you're born again, that means you are no longer living just as a citizen of this kingdom and this earth and your flesh and your passions and your agenda, but you are now translated and transported and transplanted into the family of God. You are now a resident of a new kingdom. You are living in Christ. Number two, if you've been born again, are you close to him? Are you staying close? Remember the first invitation on the shore of the Sea of Galilee was what? Follow me. Stay close to me. I'm going somewhere. Come with me. Jesus is encouraging every believer, stay close to me, live with me, let there be no distance between us. But then I want to show you something else. That's requirement A. Look at requirement B for bearing fruit. You want to be a fruit-bearing, productive Christian in 2019. Jesus got to be, you know, home base for you. But let me show you something else. He used the word abide seven times. The first six times it was all abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. Then he flips it in verse seven. He said, not only abide in me, but let my words abide 
in you. Now, all of a sudden, it is not you abiding in him. It's his words abiding in you. Look at verse 7. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So all of a sudden, Jesus said, if you want to be a fruit-bearing Christian, which is what this whole section of Scripture is about, here are the responsibilities you have. Here are the requirements you have. Abide in me, make me your home base, and let my words abide in you. Now, what are the words of Jesus? Where do you find the words of Jesus? The Bible, of course. We find the words of Jesus in the Gospels. We find the words of Jesus extrapolated out through the teaching of the early church, uh, through the entire New Testament. And quite honestly, we find the word of Jesus by looking backwards all the way to the book of Genesis. Because remember, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill it. In other words, I am the fulfillment of the Bible. I, the whole Bible, he said, is written about me. Remember what he told the uh, uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus? And you say, well, I do remember, but remind me. The Bible says he opened their minds and he began to teach them everything that was written about him in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, which is everything from Genesis to Malachi. And he said, I am the fulfillment. All of this, the whole Old Testament, is ultimately a story about me. And ladies and gentlemen, no other teacher uh, in history could, with integrity and honesty, make the statement, open your Bible anywhere, it's all about me. Only Jesus could say that. Why? Because the whole Bible is about him. He's the center of the Bible. So if you want the words of the Lord to abide in you, if you want the word of the Lord to live in you, guess what? Live in the Bible. Read the Bible. You say, well, this is kind of fundamental. Yeah, it is. And let me tell you why. Ten years ago, approximately, Willow Creek Community Church, which is in uh, uh, Chicago, did a self-study. And they evaluated how effective they were at ministering to their people. Now, you may have read some stuff about Willow Creek in the news lately. They've been in the news recently with some stuff that isn't so good. But they've, been an, they've made a big impact as a church. And uh, they thought they were doing great. And they found out that they were doing really good with one group of people, new believers. They were doing a great job of reaching people that didn't know Jesus and bringing them into their church and teaching them some fundamentals. What they found out, though, in their self-study is the more they looked into it, the more they realized they were doing an ineffective job at helping mature believers continue on to grow in Christ. So they analyzed where they were going wrong. They did a complete self-study. They revealed the results of the study. It helped a lot of other churches. And they discovered that there was one spiritual discipline far and above more important than any other that if you would practice this spiritual discipline, you would continue to grow and mature in Christ throughout your lifetime. And the spiritual discipline they discovered that was more important than any other is reading the Bible. They said, if a disciple will engage with Scripture, that discipline itself will have more impact on their spiritual health and spiritual growth and spiritual life than any other spiritual discipline. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in a way, uh, all I want to say is my grandmother knew that. Amen? I'm thankful that they discovered this. I'm glad we have the empirical evidence. But Grandma knew if you get in the Word of God and stay in the Word of God, you're going to grow in the Lord. Lifeway, the research uh, arm of our own denomination, did a 10-year study, sort of concurrent with the study out of Willow Creek. They did a 10-year study of Americans all over the United States, and here's what they found. They said there is one spiritual discipline that is head and shoulders more important than all the other spiritual disciplines. In fact, this spiritual discipline, if practiced, will give meaning and, uh, you know, uh, life to all the other spiritual disciplines. And here's what Lifeway discovered after a 10-year study, that nothing is more important as a practice for you and me than reading the Bible. I didn't say studying the Bible. I didn't say listening to a sermon about the Bible. I didn't say go to seminary and take a couple of classes in the Bible. Read the Bible. There's something powerful about getting in the Word of God and letting the Word of the Lord abide in 
you. Therefore, I have challenged us as a church, all of our campuses, to make a commitment. You have it in this little booklet here. It's a very simple little booklet. I'll add to it as time goes on probably. But here's a simple little challenge. I am challenging our entire congregation. And by the way, you may be a guest. And I'm glad for anybody to take this challenge. I hope everybody will take it. I am challenging you to read one chapter of Scripture a day for the next 133 days. You say, what? That's a lot. Really? Really? One chapter every day for the next 133 days. You say, why 133 days? Because I chose 10 books and there's 133 chapters. And I chose these books for a reason. Because these 10 books are representative samples of the entire New Testament. You've got Mark, which is one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I chose the shortest. I'm giving you an easy start. Number two, you've got John. It's a completely different uh, analysis of the life of Jesus. Uh, It looks at a different part of his ministry. So you've got Mark and John. Then you've got two of Then you've got the book of Acts, which is like no other book of its kind. It tells the story of the early church. You've got to read that. Then you've got two of Paul's letters. Then you've got Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, Jude, and Revelation. These 10 books, you read these 10 books, and you will have a survey sample of the entire New Testament. Every author is included with the exception of Matthew. And uh, you say, why didn't you include Matthew? I just didn't. (laughs) You can if you want to. But here's what I'm asking all of us to do. Read one chapter. Starting tomorrow, read Mark chapter 1. Now, here's what's going to happen. Here's what I'm asking hundreds and hundreds of us to do. I'm asking you to read Mark chapter 1 tomorrow. And and then check the list. If you go to page 9 in this little booklet, there's your checklist, and you can keep it. You can also go to hpbc.org, and this checklist is on there. You're also going to follow me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or follow Hyde Park on its Facebook page or its Twitter page, and every day we're going to tweet out or put on social media the day uh, that what chapter we're supposed to be reading that day. Tomorrow morning when you get up, go to kaibowman.com. You'll find a little devotional about the book of Mark that'll kind of give you a little place to start, something to kind of, you know, whet your appetite, a little bit of, you know, something to inspire you. Very brief, about 600 words. And then when John, it's time to start John, there'll be a devotional on John. You're also going to read, you're also going to memorize 10 verses of scripture. You go, oh, I can't remember anything. Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. You can do it. And by the way, Mark has 16 chapters. You have 16 days to memorize one verse. John has 21 chapters. You have 21 days to memorize verse 2. You can do it. As a matter of fact, how many of you know that sometimes you get a song stuck in your head and you don't even like the song and you can't even get it out of your head? Because if you hear something often enough, you'll remember it. So if you cannot remember Scripture, just sing it. Get yourself a little tune and sing it. Now, please don't do this in public because we want a good representation of who we are as a church. Amen? And, uh, but whatever you do, look, we've made this as simple as we know how to make it. We've made it almost too simple. But here's the complexity. You've got to keep doing it. You see, we're super good at making commitments. We're not all that great at keeping them. What we've done is design this in a simple way with a lot of incentives. And here's the, real, here's the real issue, ladies and gentlemen. In LifeWay's study, here's what they found. More than 50% of Americans, now hear what I'm saying. This isn't just a dead statistic. This is your family, your friends, your coworkers. More than 50% of Americans have never read a word of the Bible or have only read a few sentences of the Bible in their lifetime. That means that you and I are living in the most biblically illiterate culture in the history of our nation. But there's something worse. In the 10-year study, LifeWay found that about half of Christians do not read the Bible on a daily basis. 
Now, on the one hand, you can say, well, praise God that half do. Well, amen. And some of you read the Bible every day. In fact, half of you do and half of you don't. And so what we're trying to do is say, we're all going to do this. This is something in 2019 we're all going to do. And we have made it entry-level simple for the people that have not been able to keep their commitments in the past. I mean, after all, some of you have made commitments to read the Bible in the past. Here's what you do. You start with Genesis, Exodus, and you burn out by Leviticus. And you're done. And you think, I'll never get this done. Well, we have taken the trouble out of it. We're making it easy for you. You say, well, it's so easy. Maybe it's simplistic. It's entry level for a reason. We want everybody to win. We want everybody to succeed. Now, you may say, well, pastor, I already have a Bible reading plan. I'm already on you version with the plans. I've already got a commitment to read the Bible through in, in 2019. Awesome. I am asking you for the sake of the other half of the team, add another chapter to your daily plan okay, so that we can all be together on this. And I'm going to tell you why I think this is important. Can you imagine the impact of a congregation when hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of us are all immersed in the Word of God together, and we're all doing this as a team? Because ladies and gentlemen, let me say this with love, then let me say it as your pastor, a biblically illiterate culture will not be changed by a biblically illiterate church. We've got to make some commitments. Now, I wish I could go on and talk a little bit more about prayer because the next thing he says is ask. And that's the second, you know, commitment. Ask. Not only abide in the Word, but ask. Prayer and Bible study go together. And if you will pray and read your Bible on a regular basis, I promise you, Life will be manifested through you. The life of Jesus will begin to show through you. Listen, whatever you're full of, you'll spill when you're jostled. And if you will immerse yourself in the Word of God and fill yourself with prayer and let your life be dominated by these two spiritual disciplines, Jesus said, abide in me, let my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. And by this you will bear much fruit, proving to be my disciples. So here's the bottom line. Abide and ask. That's what I'm asking you to commit to for the next 133 days. Now, I truly believe that if you'll do this for 133 days, it'll be a lifetime commitment for you. You'll never stop. You'll keep going. But from now till May 27th, which is essentially the end of the school year, so this is a semester project, okay? If you will do these things, you're going to see growth in your Christian life. It's an inevitability. But let me, let me say something that surprised me. When I look at this passage and I see these two verbs, these two action points, abide and ask, I assume before I do my study that they're imperatives, they're commands. These are not commands. It, it actually surprised me a little bit. I expected these to be imperative verbs. I insist you abide. I insist you ask. But they're not. These verbs are the kind of actions which represent, stay with me, these two actions represent a high degree of possibility or probability. When we translate this kind of verb, we often use the word might in the translation. You say, what do you mean? Like a real, like close translation to this, a kind of a really ultra-literal translation might be, you might abide, you might ask. And as I was studying over that and praying over that, I realized what Jesus is saying. When it comes right down to it, there's a part of your spiritual growth that rests upon this. You might do something about this. You might not. There's a possibility that you'll do something. There's a possibility you won't. 
But there's a guarantee that if you will, you'll bear fruit. So everything that I've just said boils down to this one question. What are you going to do? Would you stand with me all over this place? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will really challenge our spirits, that we will take on this challenge of reading your word and being men and women of prayer, and that for the next 133 days, no matter what happens, no matter what the doctor says, no matter what the lawyer says, no matter what the banker says, no matter no matter what the teacher says, no matter what circumstances may come our way that we didn't expect, that we will abide in your, that we will abide in you, that your word will abide in us, and that we will ask bold prayers in the name of Jesus.